Before he went to the cross, Jesus told his disciples that he would be returning to the Father, but they would do the works that he had done, and even greater works. He also told them they would experience persecution, but that the Holy Spirit was coming to help them and guide them and disclose what's to come. Jesus had been preparing them for powerful ministry that would change the world. But though he's been resurrected, they still don't really know what to do. Jesus is faithful to minister to them and teach them still. Let's see what unfolds. I'm in John chapter 21, verse 1, reading from the New American Standard Version. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will also come with you. They went out and got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. So we've got seven disciples here, including the ones we're very familiar with. Peter, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Nathaniel from chapter one. And here we've got Thomas again. Peter says, I'm going fishing. And it's like an announcement. They've all been together, probably waiting. Twice when Jesus appeared in chapter 20, they'd all been together behind closed doors. Maybe that was the case this time. They're not sure what to do. They don't know when Jesus might appear again. They don't know what's next or when. They're just waiting. Peter turns to what he knows. I'm going fishing. Matthew 4, 18 through 20 says this. Now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. So this is what Peter used to do. It's who he used to be. It's his comfort zone. After the pain, and shame of denying his Lord, maybe Peter thinks this is all he's suited for. The others say they're coming too, but they fish all night and catch nothing. Not just that they don't catch much, they catch nothing. This was Peter's occupation. He's failing at this too. Continuing verse four. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, Children, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. So they cast, and then they were not able to haul it in, because of the great number of fish. This is a serious effort they put in. They were fishing all night. How frustrating it must have been. Jesus lets them toil all night. And at dawn, he appears. And he asks just the question you want to hear when you're frustrated and have nothing to show for an entire night's work. Children, you don't have any fish do you they don't know who it is they probably halfway grumble no he tells them to cast the net on the other side of the boat which they've probably done all night alternating different sides but they go ahead and do it and like the fish and the loaves it's way more than they need they can't haul it in Continuing verse 7. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. 
So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. I love that John recognizes his Lord by the sign he's performed. No one else can do that, only God. Peter, ever impetuous, throws himself into the water. I love it though, he wants to get to his Lord. He'll just swim faster than the boat could get him there. It lets us know how much Peter had been anticipating this, the next time Jesus would appear. Continuing verse nine. So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, a hundred and fifty three. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. An amazing Savior who loves and cares for us. Jesus could have said, Okay, I performed the miracle, provided a haul of fish for you, cook it up so we can eat. But they've got to be starving after toiling all night. He's prepared his own fish and bread as well and says, come have breakfast. He tells them to bring some of the fish they caught as well. Peter's adrenaline is going. He swam to shore now he draws the net full of fish and Jesus serves them. Continuing verse 15. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. The disciples have had breakfast with Jesus we don't know what they've talked about, but now Jesus singles out Peter, except he doesn't call him Peter. Remember in chapter one, Jesus said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Now Jesus calls him Simon again, which was probably jarring. Then Jesus says, do you love me more than these? This is the elephant in the room. It's the third time Jesus has appeared and the disciples have rejoiced. And even now, Peter was exuberant when he appeared. But there's that matter of Peter denying him three times. Peter actually said he wasn't a disciple of Jesus. He had wept bitterly. He failed Jesus. Now, here it is. Jesus is addressing it in front of everyone. Do you love me more than these? I don't think Jesus is saying more than these other disciples. He tells Peter a few verses down not to compare himself to John. Jesus is saying, do you love me more than these things? The fishing, who you used to be, the thing you just returned to. And when Jesus says love, he uses a form of agape, the highest love. When Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, he uses phileo, brotherly love. I don't think it necessarily means that Peter is affirmatively saying, I don't love you to the highest degree. I think it's part of the shame. How could he claim to love Jesus in the highest way after denying him? Jesus graciously says, tend my lambs. 
He's the good shepherd. He loves and cares for the sheep. Jesus calls them my lambs, the littlest ones he's willing to put in Peter's care. He's saying he entrusts them to Peter. Continuing verse 16, he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. The second time, Jesus again says, do you love me? Agape love. And Peter says again, you know that I love you. Phileo love. Jesus says, shepherd my sheep. Peter, I'm entrusting not just the lambs, but the sheep to you. The third time Jesus says, do you love me? Phileo love. He uses the term of brotherly love that Peter's been using. Jesus asks if that level is true of Peter. And that grieves Peter. Peter appeals to Jesus' omniscience and how comforting. If Peter loves Jesus, Jesus knows because he's God. So Peter says, you know all things. You know I love you. Jesus says, tend my sheep. Peter betrayed Jesus three times. Three times Jesus affirms Peter's love for him. And three times Jesus affirms what he's calling Peter to do. In his love for Peter, he restored Peter and made his calling sure. Continuing verse 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. The one who also had leaned back on his bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Jesus had affirmed Peter's calling to tend his sheep. Then he tells Peter he will die in service to this calling to glorify God. Peter knows it won't be the same. He won't deny Jesus again, which is reassuring. As Jesus said at the beginning of his ministry when Peter was fishing, Jesus says again, follow me. But you gotta love Peter. He says what's on his mind. He knows John is one whom Jesus loves. So he says, Lord, and what about this man? And you have to love Jesus' response. Peter, get your eyes off of John. Your calling is yours. His calling is his, and it's got nothing to do with you. Your eyes just need to be on me. You follow me. Continuing verse 23. Therefore, this saying went out among the brethren that that disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that? To you. This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which, if they were written in detail, 
I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. And that's how John closes his gospel. As a disciple who has given his testimony, certifying that these things are true. I cannot wait to get to glory and hear about all the other things Jesus did while he was on earth so much that books upon books could be written. But here in this book, John wrote enough, enough for us to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing we may have life in his name. In this book, we see the deity of Jesus who was in the beginning with God, through whom everything was created. We see the humanity of Jesus who put on flesh and dwelt among us, his divine glory evident, full of grace and truth. We see the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We see the resurrection and the life, who is the way, the truth, and the life. I pray that the glory of Christ shines in your heart. I pray that you believe and have life in his name. I pray you know that in him you never have to thirst. I pray you walk with Jesus as your friend, abiding in him. He's the vine, you are the branches. By his grace, daily cling to him.